Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here at Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. I want to welcome those of you that are worshiping here with us in the uh, worship center, as well as those joining us online. We want to say hi to you as well, and uh, we just pray that this will be a time of blessing to each of you. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, we would encourage you to go to our website, complete the visitor registration form there so we have a record of your visit. It also helps staff to get to know names, get to know who you are, so that we can um, better connect with you. How are you, Jerry? Doing well. Good morning. Good. Now, what did you tell me first service? Well, I, I'm keeping my social distance. We told the kids last week that since we live in the cove, a good way to remember this is to keep the distance of a cow in between you and another person. So when you're trying to picture how far away you should stay, you try to picture a cow in between you. Okay. So while the rest of the world says six feet we here in the cow. cove, we say a cow's, dis <laughs> a cow's, cow's length, huh? That's right. Okay. Well, that's good. Awesome. Well, we were really excited to see some kids, and I'm glad to see kids here again this morning. It was fun to actually have kids in our classrooms last week. That was a great change to have. Um, we do have some fun things coming up for our families. This week, we finish up our Bible school. So we've been, every Wednesday night, we've been doing um, outdoor Bible school. So this is our last week for that. Next week, we have our end of summer celebration pool party. And that's open to any family, even if you haven't been coming to Bible school. We'd love to have you join us next Wednesday from 7 to 9 up at the park. Um, and we'll be in the pavilion and then over in the pool, just having a good time, spending time together. We also have something really fun for our kids this week. Um, we have, Aaron and I have put together a special back to school surprise for you. Um, we know school's gonna look a little bit different this year and it even looks a little different to come to church. So we're trying to make this fun for everyone. So sometime this week, we're gonna do what we call Ding Dong Dash. And we are going to bring a special delivery to your house and we're going to run up to your door, bang on the door, ring the doorknob, leave you a special surprise, and leave so we don't have to be in contact with you. We don't want to touch you. But we're going to leave you a special surprise to get you excited about being back in school. So, so they won't know when this is going to be. They won't know when it's coming. It'll be sometime this, sometime week. this week. We don't know when. And all of a sudden, somebody's going to run up, That's ring right. your doorbell, or bang on it, leave you something, and take off. And you won't even see us. We're going to be super fast. Okay. All right. All right, sounds good. Uh, just also a reminder, our all-church picnic coming up Sunday, August the 30th. That's up at the park up here. We'll start at 1030 with a service. There will also be baptism. So if you or someone in your family would like to be baptized, uh, please go to the website. You need to do that fairly quickly. Uh, go to the website, fill out the registration form there because we need to set up a time to video your testimony. So it's really important if God is leading you to be baptized, we want to encourage you to do so by completing that. Uh, the same day, 1130 will be lunch and you bring your own lunch. We want to reduce the amount of contact. We typically do a potluck meal, but we, you bring your own lunch that day as well as your own lawn chair uh, on, on that day as well. And then at 12 o'clock, there'll be bowling, some activities, skating. I think there's also some ice cream, things like that. Uh, so make sure you mark August the 30th up at the park starting at 1030. That'll be our worship service that day. And we have a lot of other fun activities coming up for the men and the ladies. Um, make sure you check out the website and click on the men's ministry or the women's ministry tab. Um, there's kayaking, a fall retreat, um, lots of Bible study options happening. So make sure you go to the website and look for that. Look also for the youth activities. This week there's regular cell group, and I think this is the last one. And then next week will be the back to school bash again. Hard to believe we're there already. Yeah, that's correct. If you are not getting the digital update, please make sure you call the church office so that we can get you on that email. Each week, digital update comes out twice a week. Uh, so if you if you aren't getting that and you want to get that, call the church office. Also, semi-annual reports are also on the website. You can access them as well uh, to see what has been going on over the last six months in each of the different areas of the church. If you would stand with me now and uh, we'll read the call to worship. Taken from Psalm chapter 134, verses 1 through 2. It says, read with me, Come, bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Father, we come before you this morning and we just pray that uh, we will be able to eliminate, remove, that your spirit will help us to move anything that would hinder our worship of you. Our thoughts and our feelings, our heart is extended to you, Father. And I just pray that uh, the busyness of the past week or what we face in the days ahead 
would not uh, would not uh, hinder in any any way the way that we which we worship you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. And now, Father, we just pray through the lifting up our voices. We thank you for the gift of song and music, and just pray that the lyrics that we sing will come from our heart. We give this prayer in the name of your Son. Amen. Now let's sing together. You were the Word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus you didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a wonderful name it is nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave, the heavens are roaring. Praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name. name it is what a powerful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a powerful name it is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus you have no rival you have no equal Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. My what a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is.
Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said, if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong. Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on that cross, he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong. Jesus strong and kind. Uh, dear Jesus, thank you for being uh, both strong and kind. Thank you for being a God that allows us to, to come to you. And you're also a God that comes to us. And I pray uh, this morning as we dive into your word that there will be that, there, that both would happen, that you would come to us, and we'd be willing to come to you. We give this prayer in your name. Amen. You may now be seated. And our children are going to be dismissed. Our pre-K are going to go on this side, and our elementary will go on this side. And uh, today we're going to be continuing our series in Romans, and it's going to be, our series in Romans is called Faith in Community, and today we're going to wrap up uh, chapter 12 uh, of our Romans series. And before we actually just go into the slides or anything like that, uh, something uh, I, I read this one time, which is this guy named A.W. Tozer. And he said, basically, this was the idea he was getting at. Whatever you think about God, that is the most important thought you will have, and that will shape your life. Whatever thoughts you have about God, those are the thoughts that will shape your life. So 
if that's true, a question I want to put out there to you is this. Happiness. Happiness. Does God genuinely care about you being happy? Because what ends up happening a lot of times when we put this out there, does God care about you being happy when we say this? Or like popular message in a lot of churches. Hey, you know, God cares about your holiness, not so much about your happiness. Or, or, or we say this, hey, you know, God, he really doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your joy. And we say, hey, you know, joy is over here and happiness over here. So, and that's really popular teaching that we separate joy and happiness. Or we say God is really invested in your holiness and not your happiness. And something I would like to do, I'd like to push back against that idea because when you look at just the biblical language, joy and happiness, they're kind of used interchangeably. That they, they walk hand in hand. That from like a biblical language standpoint, there's no difference between joy and happiness. And actually, I, there's three articles I went through this week and I won't go through them uh, right now, but guess what, you can, because they're in my notes. So I put three different articles out there for you to read about what does the Bible say about joy and happiness, and I would encourage you to really just take, a, take some time, look at those articles, because it's really fascinating, this whole idea that joy and happiness are one and the same with the biblical language, and that God is genuinely invested in you being happy, that holiness and happiness don't have to do this, but then you can do this. That if you're a holy person, you can be a happy person. And if you're a happy person, you can be a holy person. And no one is invested more in your happiness than God. Why? Because God is invested in every area of your life. So, so why do we struggle so much with this whole idea that God wants us to be happy? And I think this is the reason why. I think a lot of us genuinely are not happy. A lot of us genuinely live lives that are not happy lives. So because I, we don't live happy lives, or because we're not happy with the state of, of who we are, and if God is good, that must mean that God isn't really invested in my happiness. And I think that's, that's a lie, because here's what happens. A lot of things that you do in life is pursuing happiness. A lot of things you do in life is in the pursuit of happiness. So this is what happens. Fo follow me here. So we tell people this. Hey, you know, holiness or happiness, God or happiness, if you can't find happiness in God, so people are going to chase after happiness in other areas of life. And that brings problems. That brings despair. That a lot of messed up lives result in people being in the pursuit of happiness apart from God. Whatever comes to mind when you think about God will shape your life. And me and Pastor Brian, we were talking about this this week. So, yeah, before I ever throw, like, controversial ideas that might be heresy, I talked with Pastor Brian beforehand. And we were in his office. We were talking about this idea about happiness and God and Christians. And this is what Pastor Brian said. He said, you know, I, I think the fear that people have is this. If you tell people that God wants them happy, and if someone isn't always happy, is that sin? I think that's what happens at times. If you're not always happy, is that sin? Well, no, because no one knew more about happiness and joy than Jesus. And yet Jesus was a man of sorrows. That Jesus wept. That a lot of times life is complex. It's not either or. It's either I'm happy or I'm sad. It's that you're a human and you're complex. And you can have seasons of happiness and sorrow and they can walk hand in hand. But yet God is still invested in you being happy. So faith in community. So how do you have happiness in faith? How do you have happiness in community? And here's the thing. God gives us, I think, some guidelines. God gives us some ideas 
how to pursue after happiness, but it's also tied to obedience. So if you have a lack of obedience, you're going to have a lack of happiness. So today, I want to show you some points from Romans chapter 12 that will lead to you to have a happy life that God desires for you to have. So let's go to our verses. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 5, and this is uh, what it says. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So you have Paul, and he talks about this whole idea that, hey, you know, that we are the body of Christ, that the church is connected, that, you know what, we, even though we're individuals, we're members of one another, that there's this togetherness that that's being sought after. And I thought this was really interesting. Uh, go to the next slide. Has anyone here seen the movie USS Indianapolis? It's on Netflix. Is anyone, okay, is anyone here a fan of Nicolas Cage, the actor? Anyone, anyone bored enough to say you like Nicolas Cage, the actor? Ah, oh, don't, I'm so happy. No, don't, don't be a fan of Nicolas Cage. He's not an actor. He's not. In every movie, he plays himself. In every single movie he's in, he's not acting. He's simply playing himself. It's Nicolas Cage as a sailor captain. It's Nicolas Cage in National Treasure. As a, Nicolas Cage has never acted a day in his life. But he, we like him enough that we put him in different movies. So anyway, that was my rabbit trail. I'm glad no one here, only two people are Nicolas Cage fans. Shame on you. But any, anyways, so this is Nicolas Cage pretending to be a Navy Admiral captain <laughs> in USS Indianapolis. And what he does he has his crew, and he gives the speech, and he says this. I am your captain. You are my crew. Apart from me, you are nothing. You are my crew. I am your captain. Without you, I am nothing. And then keep that idea, that whole idea of community being really important. Has anyone ever seen The Jungle Book? Show of hands. Anyone, okay. anyone fan of The Jungle Book? Okay, here's something. Uh, uh, as a youth pastor, uh, I'm getting old. It is. Because, you know, here's what happened. I was at junior high cell group. And I asked the kids, so kids, you ever see Jungle Book? They just stared at me. <laughs> like, what's that? There's a whole generation of kids that don't know what The Jungle Book is. And what I can say to you as parents and grandparents, shame on you. There's a whole generation that don't know who Mowgli is. In fact, I, I had one person say, uh, Mowgli, didn't the bear raise him? I'm like, no. He was raised by a pack of wolves. The wolf pack raised Mowgli. And anyways, what happened, if you actually read the actual book, the Jungle Book, there's this lead wolf. His name's Akela and the wolf pack has this saying, the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. So, I thank you, you mouth that back, I saw that, someone pay attention. Good job, households. But anyways, that whole idea of community, again, why would these two separate genres hit on the idea, hey, you're stronger together than you are as individuals, I think they're hitting on biblical truth. That go to my next slide. A happy life has Christian community. A happy life has Christian community. Go back to those uh, verses in Romans. All right, so look at verse 5. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one of another. This whole idea, if you're going to have happiness, you have to have 
Christian community. You have to have authentic community with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That if you don't have authentic, biblical Christian community, happiness will elude you. And so, and then look over here at verse 3. So why do we miss out on Christian community? Verse 3, pay, pay attention. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. So when you think clearly and when you're honest with yourself, you'll say this, hey, I need other Christians in my life, but when you think more highly of yourself, you'll say this, I really don't need other Christians in my life. All, you know, all I need is coming to church on Sunday morning. Look, if the fullest extent of your Christian community is coming to a building on a Sunday morning, singing some songs, hearing some guy talk for far too long, and then you go back home, yeah, I wouldn't want that either. Yeah, what, what's the point behind that? Authentic Christian community. What does, that, what does that look like? I remember when I was doing Forge, and I had other men pouring into my life, sending me text messages, sending me scripture that they read, saying, hey, Daryl, let's do lunch, or hey, let's get dinner together. Hey, let's pray for each other. That was amazing. That was great. That was one of the happiest periods of my life. You are members of one another, a lack of Christian community will lead to a lack of happiness that God desperately wants you to have. And what keeps you from that happiness? You probably think more highly of yourself than you should. Think with sober judgment. And when you think clearly, you'll say this. I'd be so foolish to think I can do life apart from Christian community. God is Trinity. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three separate individuals who make up one God. That God exists in community. God created Adam. And when God saw Adam in the garden... God says this, it's not good for man to be alone. So then God created Eve, and then Adam and Eve, they made little people. And how does that happen? P kids, ask your parents. Or parents, ask your kids. I don't know, society's crazy. But anyways, they have like little people, and they form like community. And then God works through countries. And then God establishes the church. And then God says, hey, your place is in community. Your place is in community. A lack of community, a lack of belonging, will always lead to a soreness in your heart. You want a happy life? Have authentic Christian community. Which brings me uh, to the uh, next point. Like, how do we even get there? How do we find that Christian community? Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes uh, in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, which brings me uh, to this point right here. A happy life has a God-driven purpose. A happy life has a God-driven purpose. Let's go back to those verses. Right? So having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. If you are a Christian, God has given you a spiritual gift. If you are a part of the family of God, God has given you a gift. He's given you something to contribute to the needs of believers and the needs of the world. 
And I love how he goes through some of these gifts. Some of these gifts are more public, some of these gifts are more private, but here's the idea. You have at least one, and if you were to follow that gifting that God has given you, that will lead you to your purpose. That to have happiness, you have to have purpose. Like, what is your reason for getting out of bed in the morning? Why do you exist? Like, why are you on this planet? God has you here to make a difference. That you are gifted and you are equipped to do something important, to do something special. Follow your gifting. Like, how has God hardwired you, right? Allow that to lead you. Allow your gifting to lead you to your purpose that God has for you. And the whole idea of exhortation is someone that's encouraging. Someone, that's what exhortation means. I know there's questions about that earlier. So, actually, I want to tell you a story. Like, what does it look like to find your God-driven purpose? Sly? Was anyone here born in the 90s? Show of hands. Any 90s? Grew up in the 90s? Okay, the 90s were amazing. <laughs> that was like the best time to be a kid. Why? Because it was pro wrestling. And this is Lex Luger. Did anyone watch pro wrestling in here? Okay, no one? Really? Just thank you. Thank, thank you very much, sir. So, so someone else is here is a liar. Right? You know you watch pro wrestling. You're just ashamed to say it. Anyway, this is the total package, Lex Luger. This guy was my hero. He was like one of like the ultimate good guy wrestlers growing up. And, okay, if you have a real good guy, you need a what? You need a bad guy. Okay, step in this guy. This is Hollywood Hulk Hogan. This guy broke every kid's heart in the 90s because he, like, he was like Captain America to wrestling until 1996, Bash on the Beach. He came into the ring and he did like a leg drop to the Macho Man, Randy Savage, and he ripped his shirt and you, you don't care about that. But anyway, he became the ultimate bad guy wrestler and he won the world championship. And for a year, he dominated the industry. And the other guy back there, that's Scott Hall, Razor Ramon. And this guy right here, he's the cameraman of WCW. And what he would do, like in the middle of a match, he would take his camera and he would hit someone back in the head. And I made that up. He didn't. He's just, I couldn't get him out of the picture. But anyways, the main guy is Hulk Hogan. He was like the ultimate bad guy wrestler of the 90s. So what happened in August of like 1997, Lex Luger had a match with Hulk Hogan for the WCW title. And what happened? Slide. Lex Luger used the torture rack to beat Hulk Hogan to win the WCW title. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not a fighter. I'm not. I haven't seen too many fights. But all the fights I've seen, I've never seen anyone use that move to end a fight. I, I've never seen anyone use like the torture rack to, to win a fight. Maybe you have, I, I've never seen that. But anyways, pro wrestling is pro wrestling. And Lex Luger, he won the WCW title. And like 12 or 13 year old me, I popped off my, like, yay, Lex Luger won. And it was a, it was a great night in my childhood because the 90s, 90s were amazing. <laughs> but anyways, Pro wrestling is scripted. That's not real life. Unfortunately, the guy, the real Lex Luger, ran some real problems in life. Slide. These are his mug shots uh, from jail. What happened in like the early 2000s, Lex Luger, he was, leave, he was living a double life. Uh, he was cheating on his wife. He had a mistress. He was heavily involved in drugs. And uh, during that whole time period, uh, sh his mistress ended up having an overdose, and she died uh, because of that. And Lex Luger got put in jail, and he had, like, he got probation, like, he would still struggle with drug abuse, he would go back in jail. The last time he was in jail, there was this chaplain, uh, this pastor who served as a chaplain. He went to the jail, and he gave Lex Luger a Bible, and Lex Luger was in prison, and he was reading the Bible, and he read through Ecclesiastes, and I believe he got through Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and verse 12, and it talks about this whole idea that meaningless is success. Like, meaningless is the man that chases after success, because it's like trying to grab the wind. 
and Lex Luger read that, and he said the first time he read that, he wept. He said for 47 years, he had been a man trying to grab the wind, and he wept in that prison cell. And then later on, when he got out of prison, that chaplain formed a friendship with Lex Luger, and eventually that chaplain led Lex Luger to Christ, and Lex Luger got saved. So a year and a half after he got saved, he was in the gym, and he was working out, and he lifted like way too much weight, and he heard like this pop in his neck. And he got on an airplane, and he tried to turn his head, and he said the next thing he remembered, he woke up in like a hotel room, and he was paralyzed from the neck down. And during that time period, uh, God, he brought healing to him. God allowed him to be able to, to walk again. But during that whole time period, he lost all of his muscles. And this is what Lex Luger looks like today. He lost all of his muscle mass and everything. But yet, uh, he had an interview on, I think, with uh, Patterson or something like that. But I put the interview in my notes. You should watch it. He said, I have more joy today than I ever had when I was a total package. Why? Because of what Jesus has done in my life. I was a man trying to grasp after the wind. I had everything the world would tell me would bring happiness, but it didn't. I didn't know happiness until I met Christ. What does Lex Luger, what does he do now? He goes into churches in Georgia and he shares his testimony on how Jesus changed his life and how you can find happiness and and meaning and purpose in Christ. A happy life has a God-driven purpose. I want you to think about it. What about that chaplain? What if that chaplain had never, what about that pastor had volunteered to never have been a chaplain? Or what if he had never given a Bible to Lex Luger? Where would Lex Luger be today? Your God-driven purpose isn't only about you, but it's about the people that desperately need to come in contact with you. That God has a purpose for your life. Why? Not just to bring you happiness, but to allow you to impact others that desperately need you in this world, that desperately need to encounter God. But how do they encounter God? They encounter God through us. They encounter God through us. Or maybe here's another thing to think through. Lex Luger said what? He said he was a man trying to grasp after the wind. What about you? What about you? If you're not happy, if you're not happy, could it be that this morning you realizing you're someone trying to grasp after the wind? Like, you know, you have a nice summer day and you get hit by a summer breeze and it feels so good and then you try to find that breeze again. Is that you? Is that you? Remember the trap we fall for. Holiness or happiness, happiness apart from God, is that you this morning? Do do you want happiness? What's your God-driven purpose? Are you following it? Or are you following how God has gifted you and allowing that gift to carry you to the places that God desires? Or are you always on the sidelines just waiting? Which brings me to, actually, you know, this is getting kind of heavy. So let me ask this question. Is anyone, like, hungry at all? No one? Anyone? Does anyone think, thank you. Does anyone like donuts? Show of hands. Donut fans? Okay. Okay, so yeah, let's change gears a little bit. Favorite donut place? Is it Mamie's? Anyone? Some hands? Mamie's? Okay, traditions? Okay, I'll move on from there. Okay, someone. Okay, okay, maybe it's Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts, you all are wrong. The best donut place on this planet is... That's right, that's right, Ross, Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme is the best donut 
place on this planet. Don't shake your head, it is, it's true. But anyways, uh, this place is amazing. And last Saturday, I was craving some Krispy Kreme, but I, I ran into the problem. The closest Krispy Kreme is an hour and 34 minutes away. But guess what? Point number three. A happy life has Krispy Kreme. <laughs> so what did I what did I do? I hopped in my car last Saturday and I drove an hour and 34 minutes for Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> but okay, so if you're gonna drive an hour and 34 minutes for Krispy Kreme donuts, how many donuts do you get? You, 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 just, you just don't get one, right? Like how many, how many? A dozen, two dozen? Okay, wow, some of you are horrible. Two dozen, that's gluttony, that's, that's sin. I got four. <laughs> I, feel way, no, I feel bad at first I got four, but then I heard someone say two dozen, I mean, a dozen, I mean, half a, like, I'm only one person, but please, but this is horrible, you have to like, look at someone else's sin to feel better about your own life. It's horrible, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so I got four Krispy Kreme donuts, and I got a bottle of white milk. Why white milk? Because the, the milk counteracts the glaze if it's white and not chocolate, because the sugar content, and at least I told myself that. But anyways, so I'm in, I'm in Hagerstown, Maryland, eating four donuts and bottle of milk. I'm in this park. And I remember Pastor Brandt had preached a message the week before about, you know, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be a Christian, you got to be in shape and, you know, losing weight's hard. And if you have a treadmill in your basement, you're not using it, that's wrong. I have a treadmill in my basement. I haven't used it. <laughs> so I felt convicted by Brant. And even right now, I'm sure Brant's hiking somewhere. I don't like him. But I'm just kidding. I like him. He's cool. But anyways, so what, what happened, there was this park. And I began walking around this park to, to burn off. The, the four donuts, and I'm walking, but temptation is everywhere, because I found this bench, and it was, it was like, not just like a, it was like these, like, it was like this rocking bench, right, and the bench was like calling my name, and even though I knew I should be walking, I really wanted to sit on that bench, so then I began trying to get to this bench, I mean, I'm like a good way from it, but I'm trying to walk to the bench, and this old guy, He's walking to the bench, too, just to see a clear picture. He's like, he's like an old white guy, so he's using the visual, right? He's walking to the bench, too, but he doesn't realize I'm trying to walk to the bench, and I realize if I do a dead sprint, I can beat him to that bench. <laughs> but, but if I do that, other people in the park are going to realize, like, well, that's messed up. So, so I didn't want to do that, so what did I do instead? I, I power walked, and I'm like... I'm like trying to power walk to the to, to the bench, right? But I'm not sure. He was like, I'm not. He was in shape for an old guy. Can he beat me to the bench? And it got awkward though, because I was walking to the bench, so I veered off to this tree, and, and I just began leaning on the tree like nonchalant. And, and I was thinking, yeah, how long is he gonna rock on this bench? And he kept on rocking on the bench like he was tempting me conning me, and he was on the bench for way too long. So then I began talking to myself, saying, hey, it's a big bench, we, we could share. Like, why am I, like, what's holding me back from wanting to sit on the bench with this guy? Like, hey, well, he's a stranger, I don't know him. What about if I, what about if I think he's weird? Like, I don't, but then he kept on rocking on the bench. So then I swallowed my pride, and I emerged from the tree. And I sat beside him on the bench. So now, so now the two of us were just rocking on this bench together in a park in Maryland. And as we're rocking on this bench together, we never exchanged names because men who rock on benches together don't, don't exchange names. It's not, it's not the manly thing to do. But anyways, you know, we begin talking about life. And it turns out this guy was married for 52 years. His wife had passed not too long ago. He was in the military. He had lived this really cool life. And then I began thinking about myself, like, man, what type of stories am I going to be able to tell when I'm his age? 
And then we were just talking, and then you know, he began asking me questions. He said, okay, so I have a question for you. So, son, and it doesn't even, it doesn't even matter to me. So are you married to a white girl or a colored girl? And son, it doesn't even matter. So what type of girl are you married to? And I'm like, sir, there's no girls. And then he just stared at me. And I stared at him. And we're rocking on this bench. <laughs> it's kind of awkward. And then, I, I kid you not, he said, his head was like, that's all right. That's all right. And, you know, and then we talked a little bit more, and then he, he got up to leave because there was this concert, like playing 50s and 60s music in the park, and he wanted to go to that, and, and he left. But why do I tell you that? Like, that was a really great story I, I had with this guy and learning about his life and everything. But yet, I would have missed it completely if I didn't swallow my pride, which brings me to this verse right here. Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Don't be haughty. And what does haughty mean? Don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant. And for the longest time, I, I said it like as haughty, like don't be a haughty. But that's, that's not what that says. It's don't be haughty. Pronunciation matters. But anyways, don't be so prideful that you can't associate with other people. Which brings me to this point. A happy life has encounters with people of different backgrounds. A happy life has encounters with people of different backgrounds. Because like, what did me and that guy have in common? We had nothing in common. But yet I got to talk with him. And he gave me a different perspective on life. And he made me challenge, like, what am I doing at 34? So when I get to his age, I can have, like, all these adventures and things in life. And it was this really great encounter that God had set up for me. But if I had been prideful or haughty, I can't say, well, he's too different from me. So I want nothing to do with him. Which brings me to this point right here. If I just actually go back. So if I just followed, uh, like, media and the news coverage, and if I just did that, do you know how incredibly easy it would, be, it would be for me to be racist? If only thing I ever did was talk with other black people or people that look like me, and I just followed media, it'd be incredibly easy for me to be racist. But I can't. Why? Because I know you. Because I talk with you, because I do life with you, because I consider you friends, because I love you guys, I can't be that way. But if all you do is associate with people like you, what does it do? It, it gives you this myopic view on life, a limited view on life, and it creates this, us versus them, us versus them, and you live this angry life. You know the sad thing about the early church? It was made up of, of Gentiles and Jewish believers, and they were coming together, but yet church history, they kind of split. They went their separate ways. That as more Gentiles came in, less Jewish people wanted to be part of the church. Why? Haughtiness. Pride. They're not like us. They're not like us. One of the saddest things about church is this, that people say, I can't go to church with people that aren't like me. And you miss out on happiness. A happy life has encounters with people of different backgrounds. Which brings me to this point right here. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 18. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I'm going to read this one more time. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So what's happened uh, past couple of weeks, we have sports. Sports are back, like on the major league level. We have basketball, baseball, 
hockey. Pastor Brian, I'm sorry, the pins got eliminated. I mean, I shouldn't have said hockey. Well, hockey doesn't count anymore. But you know, we have sports, and they're back. But with sports coming back, uh, we've seen nationally there's been controversy with that. It seems like everything's political now. No matter what you do, there's always a political aspect to life. So what happened with sports? Let's look at some of these pictures. We have players kneeling and the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and this has caused controversy for people. And so why am I putting these pictures on here right now? It's not to upset you or to anything like that, but it's to say this. This is the world we live in. And how, as Christians in the 21st century, how do you navigate through this world? So we had a lot of players kneeling when the NBA first came back. And let's go to the next picture. But everyone wasn't kneeling. This is Coach Popovich of the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, he served in the military, and he has those roots. They asked him, okay, so why did you refuse to kneel? Uh, he didn't want to say anything, but he still wore a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. But the very first week when the NBA came back, there was only one player that refused to kneel. Let's go. And this is Jonathan Isaac. He was the first player to refuse to kneel. He also didn't wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. And, you know, so they're asking him, so Jonathan, like, what's going on here? Why aren't you kneeling? Why aren't you wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt? Some things to know about Jonathan Isaac, he's 22 years old, he's an ordained minister uh, of the gospel, and he tied his answer back to this. He says the reason why I didn't kneel, or the reason why I didn't wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, is because, uh, you know, I believe through the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe uh, that's how people are created equal, I believe that's how we support, like, black lives, I believe that's how we support all lives, is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jonathan Isaac, that's what his answer was. And I guess uh, for the sake of controversy, I should tell you my stance on things. When it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, I do not support that. The reason why, uh, there's, I read the website. Uh, there's some things there, I'm not sure how you can square that with biblical Christianity. Uh, things on the family and things of that nature. So, re so I would reject the Black Lives Matter movement. When we come to the statement, Black Lives Matter, obviously I, I support, I support the statement, Black Lives Do Matter, yes, yes they, very much, especially, especially mine, but <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, that could have gone 50-50, thank you, but uh, you know, do I believe there's issues of racism and police brutality and systemic, I, I, I do, I believe in all of that. But that doesn't mean I support the movement, but I do support the saying, Black Lives Matter. And Jonathan Isaac would find himself in the same boat with that belief system. But here's one more picture I want to show you. This is uh, Myers Leonard. Uh, he stood for the National Anthem. And the reason why he stood is because he has family in the military. And so to support his family in the military, his conscience wouldn't allow him to kneel. So his, uh, basically, his convictions uh, made him stand. And here's the, here's the amazing thing, right? Their convictions made them kneel. Everyone was following their convictions. The conviction to kneel, the conviction to stand, was all convictions. But here's something really cool. If you notice in this picture, both players, like on each side of him, they, they grabbed his legs. Why? Because they're saying this. Even though we disagree about standing versus kneeling, we still support each other. Even though we disagree on this issue, I still honor the humanity in you, and I see you as a teammate, and I see you as a person I can still do life with. So what's the point I want to bring to you is this. A happy life has love your neighbor actively on mind. A happy life has love your neighbor actively on mind. And here, I said this in the first service, I'll say this right now. I think a lot of times as pastors, we overreach what the Bible says. And I'll be honest, I cannot find one Bible verse that says kneel or stand for a national anthem. It's not there. But I could find tons of verses 
that says love your neighbor. I can find tons of verses that say that that's how you do that. In this new world where everything's political, where everything's controversial, right? You can't always say, hey, the Bible says this for the controversial stuff, but the Bible clearly says love your neighbor. So what does it do when we get to controversial gray areas? Let's fall back on the clear teachings of Scripture. The clear teaching of Scripture is this. When it comes to someone that's kneeling or not kneeling or a mask or, or no mask or a Republican or, or Democrat, when we get to these issues where the Bible isn't explicitly clear, let's not force God to say something that God didn't say. But let's be obedient to the truth that God has given us. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not sure if Myers, Leonard, or those two other guys were Christians or not, but they're giving us a beautiful example of what it means to love your neighbor when you disagree with them. They disagree. If you're going to disagree with something, disagree. That's your freedom in Christ. But use your disagreement in such a way as to honor the humanity in the person you disagree with. Which brings me to this uh, final point. Right here, Romans 12, 19 through 21. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Which brings me to this final point. A happy life has God act as God and his servant act as his servant. I'll read that one more time. A happy life has God act as God and his servant act as his servant. God says, let vengeance be mine. Let God handle the ugly in people. That's not what you have to do. God says be kind to your enemies. Be kind to those you disagree with. Why? Because this whole idea uh, is this. That you will keep burning coals on their head and keeping burning coals on someone's head. It's not that you're just like sticking it to them, but it's actually a practice back in Proverbs in Egypt. Whenever you had a dispute with someone and you were super kind to them, right, and it, it moved on their heart in such a way that they wanted to repent, and they would have a basket of burning coals, and the basket would signify, hey, I'm sorry for the way I've acted. In today's society, where everything is toxic, guess what? You can be toxic right back. And can you control people by being venomous? Yeah, you can. Hey, guess what? If you really want to push your agenda, be the meanest, be the loudest, be, be the cruelest person in the room. And I guarantee it, you will control that room for a time. And you could push people down if you're mean enough for a time. But guess what? People will always push back. You can be mean enough to keep someone in line for a time, but eventually they're going to fight back because you never change their heart. What does God say? He says if you live in society and it's super toxic, you don't have to be toxic back, but be kind. Why? So that gives room for God to work in their hearts to bring about that supernatural change that brings authentic repentance. I know this is a political time, and I know a lot of times as Christians, like, we have our gloves on. We're, we're going to take back society because it's us versus them. And don't you know, we're in the war for the very soul of this country? And that type of thinking has put us in the situation we're in right now in which the Christian voice is really small and no one cares what it has to say. How do you have a voice in society? What did Jesus do? Love your neighbor, love your enemy, 
that Jesus came in contact with people who he disagreed with all the time, but he was still able to love them. And by loving them, that changed their hearts into the people he always desired them to be. In our society today, you could be the most talk. Here, here's, here's how I worship me. As a youth pastor, right, if the kids are super bad, I can yell and I can scream and I can have the room, I can be in control of the room for a time. But eventually, if I never have a relationship with a student, they're going to push back against me. So what's the best thing I can do is be kind as their youth pastor, have meaningful relationships, right, so that God can work on their hearts and I can get the youth group that most honors God. Big picture on a society, you want a Christian society, you want people where people genuinely love God, you don't do that through force and power and intimidation. You do that through loving people, through being kind, not being venomous back with your social media or your text or your tweets or whatever, but you do that by loving people and allowing God to deal with vengeance, allow God to change the hearts of people in society, and that brings about the society that we always desire. So I'm going to ask Ryan to come on up as we're wrapping things up today. Whatever thoughts that come to mind when you think about God, that will desperately shape your life. God desires for you to have a happy life, but how do you get that happy life? It's tied to your obedience. It's tied to your obedience that God wants you to be happy, to be happy, Christian community, a God-driven purpose, uh, encounters with other people, love your neighbor, and let God be God. Join me in prayer. Uh, dear Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you that you are a God that's invested in every area of our lives, that you're invested in our very happiness, uh, just not in eternity, but here right now on this planet. I pray that none of us would be grasping after the wind, but that we would realize that you are invested in our lives, and that we would seek after you and that we would by seeking after you we would live the lives you've always desired for us we give this prayer in your son's name amen please stand
my days, my ever only Jesus. And I want to know you, Jesus, my to know you, Jesus my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, and I train my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus to Jesus to know you and know. Uh, please just remember that God is invested in every area of your life. And because of that, don't, don't miss out on the life God has for you. When you come out to this week, God is invested in your happiness. And I think refer back to my notes and see which area, maybe it's not all five at one time, but which area would God have you focus on this week? He's a good God. He wants to lead you. He's our shepherd. Uh, you are dismissed. Thank you.